Welcome back to the Three Wins Podcast. I'm your host, Russ Clemmer, president of Legacy Advisory Partners here in Alpharetta, Georgia. And we have a special guest here with us today, the chairman of the board of the Halftime Institute, Mr. Dean Nualny. Dean, welcome. Thank you, Russ. Happy to be here. So I've had the pleasure of, of hearing some of your story and what the Lord has been at work in you and through you to do over the years. And there's some really great things. And right out of the bat, you know, a lot of people listening understand, all right, Halftime Institute, they've heard of that. A lot more people should have heard of that. And that's part of what we want to, you know, encourage folks today on. And then you're, you're always, you're always kind of looking at and, and dealing with different things. You're a multifaceted person. So it's been great to be able to hear the different things that interest you and, and some of your background. And so that's what we want to dig into today. And for our audience listening, folks who are business leaders, business owners, there are a couple of really great nuggets that I know you'll you'll glean from the conversation with Dean today. And, and any links, anything we talk about will be in the description below. So make sure you like the like the page, like the, the podcast and subscribe and to click on that bell for any notifications. All right, so the advertisement is done. Dean, so right out of the gate, tell me about the painting. Tell me what's behind you. It, people choose certain things. I don't have anything behind me, People, but people choose certain things to go behind them in their office. The thing you see when you're going to sit down in your chair. Tell me about that. Yeah, I love this picture. It's 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 an artist's rendering for Bob Buford. You know, Bob, I wrote the book Halftime, started Halftime. He's okay. fine. When he left the marketplace, very successful in the marketplace, and went into the ministry, his, his, his instructor or his mentor, Peter Drucker, said, Bob, the way you're going to gauge success going forward is much different. It's now changed lives. It's not bottom line or profitability. And Bob's like, well, how do I keep track of that? And Peter said to him, well, I suggest you start a book of days. And you keep track every day of emails or anything else that may come in from folks that you're working with. So by the time Bob passed away in 2016, he had 75 three ring binders of book of days of all these stories from over the last 30 years. And one of our participants in our halftime program said, you know what, I want to take those book of days and do something with it. So he hired an artist. And what you see behind me is the tree, because Bob always says, our fruit grows up on other people's trees. Mm -hmm. And on that tree is probably 2,000, I would say, little stories or pictures of people that have been impacted or life, their lives have been changed because of what halftime has done and how God's worked through Bob Buford. So it's the it, it, it's just a picture of how our fruit grows up on other people's trees. That was Bob's motto. Yeah, there, there, there's a lot to unpack there. We could probably do two or three sessions just on that idea. <laughs> but but book of days, you know, I don't I've never heard it referred to that. I, people talk about keeping a journal. People call, talk about keeping you know notes and kind of summarizing what you what did you do well that day. Would you you know what would you miss? that day, but a book of days is a little bit different. Where does that, where's that terminology come from? I'm not really sure where, where it comes from, but it, it does make a lot of sense to me from the standpoint of when I was in the marketplace and in Russ, you can appreciate this too. And I'm sure folks who are listening, you're always looking at what your numbers look like according to budget and the profitability and the net income and so on and so forth. And are we growing? Are we going up to the right? And, you know, Peter just said to him, that's going to be very difficult for you to do. And one of the things in ministry is, of course, how do you keep track? How do you keep score if you're having impact or if you're not? And uh, I'm not sure where the name came from, but he suggested you just start a book of days. I, I'm not sure where it started from. But now what's happening is a, a number of our folks who have gone through halftime that have started ministries and doing some uh, doing the same thing they're also doing book of days just to keep track not to not to do it to say hey look at me but yeah it's more, 
a way to go back and you know I read I read some of the, some of the articles from the Book of Days from 1985 from folks around the world who whose lives were just absolutely changed and transformed through what Bob started with Leadership Network, which was his first ministry and then halftime. So not sure where the name came from, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So out the gate, we're talking about Bob Buford and the impact he's made on your life and the impact mm -hmm. he's made on so many people's lives. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, you know, you don't get there like you're talking about, other, you know, with the with the our fruit grows on other people's trees other people's fruit was grown on his tree, right? So there's a there's a lot to unpack just with Bob Buford. So how did you get in, how did you come across Bob Buford? What was your first introduction to that? And what made you, what was so impressive that you would then join them sure. and, and talk a little bit about, you know, where, where your life at that point and what you had been doing and just walk through that, some of that with us. Sure. I, I grew up in, in Wisconsin and we didn't have a whole lot, but we had, we had enough. But one of the things that was instilled to me at a very young age, by no fault of anyone's necessarily, but it was always, we were being compared to others. Look at what they have, look at the cars they have, look at the house they have and so on and so forth. And as a young boy, I thought to myself, well, I want to be those folks. So my whole focus as a young man was, what is the industry or where can I go and make as much money so I can start accumulating wealth in material possessions? Because, hey, that's what it looks like brings happiness. So when I was a young man, I didn't, I, I was Catholic. I, I didn't go to church a whole lot. I would, you know, swoop into church and grab the bulletin and show it to my mom as if I went to church, but I really didn't. So I, I went into the financial services industry in 1987 with Merrill Lynch and then stayed with them for a number of years, went on to UBS in a variety of others. But what I realized as I started to become more successful, make more money, accumulate more things, that whole feeling of, boy, this is what life's all about wasn't there. There was this emptiness to the material possessions. So in, in 1995, a very smart, wise lady in our office at UBS could see I was going down a path that I shouldn't have been. And she said, Dean, would you meet a friend of mine? And I said, well, who's your friend? She said, I, you know, I'm just, just trust me, just meet my friend. I said, okay, where am I meeting him? Well, you're meeting him at Chili's this Friday at 1130. So I said, what does he do? Well, he's a pastor. So why in the heck would I want to go meet with a pastor? I'm having the time of my life. And she said, please just go meet with him. Well, Russ, that was a life-changing day. That, his name is Paul Wilson. He's a pastor in San Antonio. And to this day, he's my best friend. He knows the good, bad, and ugly of Dean Nawalny. And uh, that was the journey when I started on this path to accept Christ as my Lord and Savior. So fast forward. I moved to Chicago. I was running a piece of business for UBS at the time. And he invited me to Willow Creek Community Church. And as a mm -hmm. Catholic boy, going to Willow Creek was eye-opening. You know, it, it, I remember the leader of worship up there on the piano. And I thought, man, this guy's like Jerry Lee Lewis. He was up there just hammering away on the piano. And I was like, this is church. You know, I loved it. So <laughs> fast forward to 2000 or 1999, Bill Hybels was interviewing this guy named Bob Buford. And I was sitting in the third row and I'm thinking, you know, wouldn't it be cool to be mentored by that guy? And uh, as he talked about this idea of going from success to significance, I was laser locked still on the whole success piece. But after listening to him, I read the halftime book two or three times in the early 2000s. 2006, I, I had an encounter with the Lord in my office on the 40th floor of the Mercantile Exchange Building, looking out over, quote unquote, my empire. And I just screamed out the window, God, there has to be more to life than this. My boss at that time wanted to start a book study. The book we studied was halftime. And that's how I got really, I said, well, I heard that guy get interviewed in 1999. And we started what we call the halftime huddle. And as we started to talk through the different 
ways to kind of use my giftings and strength, I was convinced at that point, 2006, I need to figure this out. So I was invited to halftime in 2008. I went through the halftime program, met Bob Buford. It was a life-changing few days for me. There was three things that really stood out that day that were life-changing for me. But through a, a, an interesting series of events for us, I, they were looking for a CEO. I was actually looking at removing myself from the financial services industry and doing something different. And my whole life shifted during that time from being all about Dean to all about how can I serve others and how can God use me to serve others? So mm -hmm. anyway, it's a much longer story, but through an interesting series of events in 2010, I was named the CEO of the Halftime Institute and my wife had a dream a few months earlier, and next thing you know, we're loading up two young kids and we're moving to Dallas, Texas from downtown Chicago. So that's how I got to have. You know, you got to be careful when your wife has dreams. Oh, yeah, it, it's the it, whole it, Yeah, it is. And, <laughs> and, you know, thank the Lord for, for wives who are in tune with the Lord. But, you know, that that usually usually we don't get the the sound and you know the, the sound direction it comes through them so many times absolutely you know, I hear, I, hey russ, russ you ought to you ought to think about so and so and i'll be like oh no what are you talking about that, that's crazy and then, well an interesting side note just really quick it's kind of funny we lisa my wife knew only of chicago in southern california there was nothing in between right you know, we were actually at an event in southern california for halftime because I just started reading and I was invited to the halftime program. Well, I thought, well, this is fantastic. She can go to Southern California and I can go to the halftime event. And that is where at 3.30 in the morning, she woke up in the middle of the night. She goes, I had the craziest dream. We're moving to Dallas, Texas, and you're going to become the CEO of the Halftime Institute. And I said, Lisa, that is crazy. I, I don't think so. But you know what? I listen to my wife very closely now when she has dreams. <laughs> now, 12 years well, later, here we are. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, you listen or else. That's kind of how that ends up happening, right? Exactly right. <laughs> so, 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 so what's that been like, the, the, the role of, of CEO and, and now chairman? Uh, what, what, is, what has that been like? Yeah, uh, I would say, and I'm sure many other nonprofit leaders would agree with this, when you're thinking of making this transition from the for-profit to the non-profit, one gentleman said to me, hey, Dean, if you think you're going to sit around, hold hands and sing Kumbaya all day, you're wrong. And I would say it was one of the most challenging transitions I've ever had. And, but also, Russ, the most rewarding, for sure. Going from a for-profit where you have plenty of resources and talent uh, that you can bring on to, re to solve certain issues that you have. You don't have access to that in the nonprofit. So when I, when I got here, one of the things I realized is I had to really re uh, rethink how I approached leadership in the nonprofit space. It was more of, you know, I can't go out and, and put money towards that to fix it. I can't go out and you know, have the top talent to fix that because let's face it, a lot of people don't want to go from, you know, making a certain amount of money and take an 80% pay cut or whatever it may be for that individual. So that was very challenging at the beginning. But once I started to understand that, I would say that when you're in your sweet spot and when you know what God's purpose is for your life and you can figure that out, there is nothing better because it, it doesn't, it's not work then. It, it, it's a calling. So it's not like, well, I'm going to go to work. It's like, no, this is part of my life. So I would say the halftime transition initially was interesting, challenging, but I have the opportunity now or did for 12 years to work with men and women in eight different countries all around the world who have read this little green book. It's been read by a million people. And, and the idea when Bob wrote the book was not to have a book that would sell. He, Peter just said, well, you're in a season of life. Maybe just write a book, call it halftime, going from success to significance. And the Holy Spirit took that book and now it's been read by 
millions of people. So it's been an incredible, incredible blessing from seeing uh, a lady in, in Houston who goes into uh, the hospital and rocks babies of drug addicted mothers, that's her calling, to the gentleman in Cape Town, South Africa, who started the Global Day of Prayer, all from reading the book and figuring out their calling. So phenomenal blessing. And then I would say about a year and a half ago, I just felt it was time for other leaders to take us to the next level. And uh, I stepped into the chairman's role and we brought on mm -hmm. two fantastic leaders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, I'm a couple of days away from turning 40, mm -hmm. right? And if you look at average, average lifespans, I may or may not be quite to my quote unquote halftime, but that's not really it. That's not really it. So, so kind of walk someone who maybe they've never read the book, but they're in that they're in that you know season of life, whether it's you know twenty five years old or sixty five years old, or eighty five years old for that matter, and they're thinking, all right, there's a there's this way of thinking mm -hmm. that needs to change in me. The success, the significance, kind of walk someone through what are the things they need to be paying attention to? What are the things that just kind of a summary of some of the, the high level points that, you know, they would get from a seminar, from a series walking with you guys? Yeah, I think it's a very good point, by the way. And I just want to be clear before I start, you know, people who read the book halftime think, well, I need to be in that 55 to 65 year old age range. I need to be wealthy like Bob Buford. That's just absolutely not the case, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Halftime. Bob didn't know what to call the book. So Peter said, you like football, call it halftime. So you equate, equate halftime to midlife. The reality is that it's a season of life. I mean, we just had someone go through our program who was 27 and another gentleman who's 83. So I guess you could call that you know, preseason and overtime. I, I don't know, but none of that. <laughs> yeah. It's this season of halftime. And for me, anyway, the indicators were pretty obvious. And that was, I felt what I call now smoldering discontent. You know, this smoldering discontent. And I was in position to get raises. I was in a position to get promoted. I was in positions to get bigger bonuses. And they just felt empty, quite honestly, to me at that point. I actually started to refer other folks instead of myself to get the promotions. And so there was this smoldering discontent at that time that there was much more that I could do with the gifts and talents that the Lord had given me to have a bigger impact for the kingdom. Now, many business owners have their ministry right in front of them, and there's an opportunity to use that as their ministry. Some people leave the marketplace, go into the ministry, right? Most, 60% of them stay right where they're at, and, and that becomes their ministry. So for me, during that season, I'll call the smoldering discontent season, it's like I really felt this emptiness of how can I do more to impact others? How can I do more to impact the kingdom? And I think in Bob's book, he, he will talk about when you're starting to pass up on raises and they don't feel like they used to or the promotions and all that, you're really in this season of season of halftime when you're thinking. So to answer the question, it is not, it is not that age group. It is, it's truly a season. Now I'll, I'll just say this also, Bob used the tagline, in 1990, going from success to significant. And I will tell you, that's an old tagline. Most folks now, the younger generation is like, hey, I don't want to do this success to significance thing. I want to be significant now. So, and if you look like, look at a stay at home mom, I think she would argue with you that I'm doing significance right now at home. So the idea is really more of a mindset of how can you serve others? How can you serve the kingdom? So there's no age to it. It's, it's really a season. And we have people, men, women, all different ages now going through the program. Did you grow up playing hockey, Wisconsin? I, didn't. I love hockey, but I never played it. No, I did not. Well, they don't even have a halftime, right? 
They don't. That's right. Yeah. So if you're a hockey lover, you halftime is just a word, right? It, yeah. It's just a word. So I love the fact that the younger folks mm-hmm. talking about significance now, and and I don't know, I don't know, you know, the 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 anthropological study of being able to dissect, you know, why the the you know the folks right now say I want to impact today. Right there, they, they are the, the you know the trends and the studies all show that the the, the younger generations are, hey, I'm not going to be on a corporate ladder for you know for for thirty years, and then I want to be significant in what I'm doing now. Yeah, and it's a completely different way of thinking about Absolutely. compensation, about benefits, about all these different things that you would typically see in the workplace and in the not for profit, and it's refreshing, but at the same, at the same time, there's a little bit of a shift, right? There's a shift in how people think and connecting the generations who, you know, think a little bit differently. So in, in, and I think that's the the beauty of this is the transition in life, Mm -hmm. right? The the transition in life and, and not to put words in your mouth, but the way I look at it is, and what I've seen in, in, you know, my few years is that you start to have that discontent because the Holy Spirit is telling you, hey, get ready. It's not always that the Holy Spirit shifts you from one thing to the next, uh, like a hard right-hand turn. That's right. A lot of yeah. times he gives you that, he gives you that on-ramp, right? He gives you the opportunity to, to go through that. But it's that it's that nudging of hey you you're you're not if you if you wait three years or you or you wait two months you know that that that's up to you but you're not going to be content if you stay in this role yeah. stay in doing this thing and that's that that the beauty of the relationship with the Lord relationship being able to hear those things and be able to make that turn so so you Can got I the, Russ, real yeah quick. yeah yeah jump in there jump in I there. think you make a very good point. And that is, it, it, it's, it, first of all, the idea of living a life of significance, you know, we get pushback on that also, because that sounds like it's about us. It's really not. It's about serving others. Yeah. But I would say there, there, there's the journey of the head and, and many type A folks like myself will say, well, here's what I want to do. Here's where I want to go. This is the job that I want, but then there's the journey of the heart. It's the, when, when the heart is transformed, when the Holy Spirit starts to transform the heart, then you start looking outward. How can I use my business? How can I use my skill set? How can I use my gifting to serve others? And there is nothing better than the satisfaction of helping others and serving, serving others. And some get that when they're 27 and some yeah. get it when they're 83. Right. Yeah. And so. Yeah. And, and not to, you know, not, not to get too preachy or theological, but well, yeah, to get that way, because that's, that's where you, you end up getting some really good thoughts. And that's what this podcast is all about. Challenging people, people's thoughts and the way they live their life for the Lord, no matter what setting they're in. But you know, there was a book that I read and I read it way too young. Maybe, maybe not, but most, I don't think most middle schoolers read John Piper's book called Christian Hedonism Hmm. or the Christian, the Christian Hedonist. Have you ever read that book? I have not. Okay. So Piper takes the first item in the Westminster Confession of Faith. And you've probably heard it before. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And he unpacks it and says, here's a, here's a pagan hedonist. This is what they do. They rank out of importance the actions and thoughts and experiences that most benefit, provide the greatest amount of pleasure and enjoyment to them. So eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. That kind of mindset and going through life as if there's nothing else that matters other than me being happy and and." And so many people live that way today, but it's empty. So on the on the faith side and on the Christian side of things, what does it mean to enjoy him forever? Mm. Right? 
and, and to the fullness of that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so often in, in, even in the Catholic church, you, you get this a lot of the piety and the, the, the beating down of the carnal flesh, the self, right? And that activity of, of constantly saying, you're, you're, you know, your carnal self is bad. You're a bad person. You're bad. And, and beating that down so that the good, right, the, the, the heavenly mindedness can come out. And there is something to the idea of, of saying no to yourself, saying no to the, the ideas and the thoughts and the desires of the flesh. But what Piper talks about and what was impressive to me and what I like in what you just said, and I'm, I'm, I'm linking the two in satisfaction the satisfaction of getting into that mindset where when I am doing what God is, has designed me to do and raised me up to do, I am going to most enjoy him. And that to me is what I hear when I hear you say, getting that, that journey of the heart, the mindset of, and it doesn't matter to your point of if you're leading the you know, top 100 company and as a CEO, or you're over here, like you said, nursing and caring for these babies that are left alone. Mm, That's right. Either way, that's what God has called you to. And that's the enjoying him to the full extent, that Christian hedonist mindset. And embracing that is a big deal. I I feel like halftime does that so very well. Yeah, I would say when I met Bob in 2008, he said three things that really, really impacted me. First of all, he, he, he mentioned Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he has prepared beforehand that you may walk in them. That was the first thing he said. The second thing, Bob said, don't overcomplicate it. He goes, at the end of your life, there's going to be, in my opinion, an audit of your life. And what the first question is, what did you do about Jesus? And the second is, what did you do with the gifts that I've given you? And that really hit me because at that time, I felt good about the Jesus piece. I didn't feel good about the gifts that he had given me to use to help others. And then the last thing he said is this whole idea of going from success to significance that's only the beginning of the journey. It's really going from success to significance to surrender, ultimate surrender. Mm. Lord, what do you want to do through me with the gifts you have given me? So I just did this this past week with a few folks. When you really understand your strengths and when you really understand your spiritual gifts and you couple those with the folks that are kind of part of your ministry, if you will. When you're Mm -hmm. using your strengths and your spiritual gifts, you're really in that sweet spot that at the end of the day, you feel more energized and drained. And for me, for instance, fundraising and doing things like that, it's a drain for me to be completely Mm -hmm. honest. Mm -hmm. Sure. But I could have conversations like you and I are having with the group here, and I could do this all day long because it's in my gifting and it's, it's in my spiritual gifting also. So it's really important to understand that. What are your gifts? What are your strengths? We can be really good in things that, that aren't our top strengths. I was a very good fundraiser. But that doesn't mean it's where I found the most joy and satisfaction. So, it, yeah, the the uh, what I was a teacher and coach and administrator for a couple of years right out of college, and there was a I had a little high school leadership development course that I you know put some books and materials together and took kids through, and on the section where it was you know, who am I, who has God created me to be? I called it you university because you really have to go to school Mm -hmm. on, on who you are and what makes you tick and what drains your batteries and what, you know, charges up your batteries and the things that are meaningful. And those things are steady no matter what you're doing, but the, 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 where you do them and who you're doing them with, those are all the things that, that, the Lord changes and he, and, and he may change over time. He may impact some of those things, but you know, the difference between drives and 
you know, the, the life experiences and the nurturing and, and nature, all of those things that, that come into that, you really do need to go to school. How does, how does halftime address some of those things? Yeah, I, I, well, halftime is a, a, a process, right? Mm -hmm. uh, transformation mm -hmm. happens over time. And okay. halftime is extremely good. And of course, I'm biased, but uh, is extremely good at helping one really, first of all, understand my identity is in Christ. You start there because many leaders like myself and others find their identity in their title or their work. And it, when they make a transition, that's very challenging because they sometimes lose that identity. So once you find that your identity is in Christ, then, then halftime is extremely good at helping one figure out what are your strengths, what are your spiritual gifts, and then what are you really passionate about, and then how can we help you align with that passion. Now, again, like I said at the beginning, that may mean that we help you connect with a world vision or Compassion International or an inner city ministry or sex trafficking, whatever it is. But it also may mean that right where you're at, you have this ministry in front of you, you have a business or you're a leader and you have, that is your ministry. So we help folks really rethink their role and how can they serve in the setting they're in. So yesterday I was meeting with a gentleman <clears throat> who ran a number of businesses and he just said, Dean, my passion is to do deals. I love doing deals and I love being in the business world. So halftime really helps through their whole process and through ongoing coaching, which is critical. Mm -hmm. because you have people who have been there and done that through the coaching process, help one get really focused on what is my calling? What is my place, and how do I apply that in whatever that setting is? So I, I remember going through when, when I came through the, one of the exercises that I, I got to tell you, just threw me for a loop was the 80th birthday exercise. We probably need to move it now to the 90th birthday, but nonetheless, at the 80th birthday, <laughs> I sat down and they said, okay, Dean, it's your 80th birthday. Your wife takes you to a local restaurant. 200 of your closest friends, family, and business associates are there, and there's a microphone in the front of the room. One by one, they walk up to that microphone. What are they going to say about the impact you had on humanity or the kingdom. And I sat there and thought to myself, well, first of all, I don't know if there'd be 200 people there, probably not. But secondly, I don't know what they would say. They would say, well, Dean was a successful, Dean's a nice guy, and Dean made a lot of money and had a boat. And, but I don't think they would say anything about the eternal impact that I was having on others. And that was a really eye-opening dice for me. Now, I went to a funeral right around that same time, too. It was interesting that it was a funeral for a, a lady who was probably 80 years old and as a friend of a friend. And when we got to the church, the church was packed with kids. And I was like, man, I mean, why are all these kids here? Well, she was a teacher and she impacted the life of all these kids. Mm -hmm. And that 80th birthday party exercise in the funeral hit me like a ton of bricks. It was like, if today was my funeral, who would show up, first of all? But yeah. what would, they, who have I impacted? So yeah. half mm. really helps with, with that, Russ. I, there, there's so many different avenues we could go down with those different points. And so, so practically speaking, somebody, <laughs> they've heard enough on this podcast to say, all right, the light bulb's gone off. Yes, I need to consider all of those different questions. I'm fighting, I'm struggling with those different things. I identify with the season of smoldering discontent. And I know that there's a change going on. So I think they go, they go to the halftime website, they grab the book, they read it, they familiarize themselves with all the process and everything else. And they get in touch with who? Sure. Yeah. Well. Yes, you go to the halftime.org website and yeah. then you get in touch. Her name is Rhonda Kelbeck. 
and she is someone that you would chat with as far as what program you'd be interested in. There's, of course, the individual program. There's programs for couples. There's local programs that we're doing. There's one-on-one -on -one coaching. So there's a variety of things. And, and Rhonda really helps you understand which program is best for you. And we have right. we just okay. started for women, and uh, which is yeah. booming. So yeah, 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 yeah. So so no matter who's listening, no matter where you are in life, in in, in the season of life, contact Rhonda and check out the different programs and see which which one may be right for you. That's right. That's right. Wonderful. And I just you know the different the different being you know working with the three wins at Legacy and our specific financial services conversation that we have with business owners, founders, that is more often than not, we encounter founders who say, this business is our identity, right? This is it's a part of, it, it's, a, it's a sixth finger on my hand. You know, it's a fourth kid in my family. You know, it's just something that's always been there. And I don't really know what to do next. Right. If they've got kids that are coming up and saying, hey, you know, you've got to get out of the way. It's our turn to lead. Or you've got, you know, the, the impending sale and you don't know what you, you might have a, a pile of cash after you sell your business, but no idea what to do after that. Your, your purpose and your, your life has been wrapped up in leading that business and, and struggling with all of the how are we going to make this work, you know, this year with everything going on or. You know, now what do we do? Do we grow? Do we not? Who do we hire? Who do we? All of those different things you're tasked with as a business owner, and rightfully so, as, as that's been God's calling. And I want to come back to God's calling as a business owner in a minute. But they, they, they hit that. So do y'all have something where you're, you're at, you, you can, one of those programs that deals with specific with business owners and kind of cuts, cuts to what are the things that they challenge? They're, they're challenged with? Yeah, I would say the majority of folks that go through our program are C-level executive business owners. And that's exactly okay. what we focus on. Yeah. And and that's the beauty of, of the partnership with Legacy, right? I mean, it, it, you guys, you know, the three wins and the grade eight, fantastic for the business, right? Just fantastic. And then we can help by taking it one step further in really helping someone figure out what is their true calling. But the business yeah. owner is who we really do focus on because the majority of folks who come into our program, let's say walk down the hall looking all polished and ready to go. And then when we close the door, we open in prayer, the truth comes out. Because think about being a business owner or a C-level executive. Who are you going to go and share your challenges with? You're surely not going to go to your employees. So I just went through the halftime program again in my cohort that I'm in. They know everything about Dean. And I'm very open, even regarding my struggles here at halftime. So we do help that business owner. That whole identity thing is a big deal. And yeah. So that's our sweet spot at halftime, actually. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think the 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 idea of consuming, and I'm just my mind's jumping over to the church, right? And and sometimes the, the church struggles to teach these same principles, right? Halftime is a faith based organization, but it's a parachurch organization, and in and, and I'm sure you work in churches, but that that would be another incur you know something that I just see the value in that you're not always hearing out of the pulpit. You're not always hearing from the messaging of what churches are taking you through. And it's such a valuable thing, but back to, to, to the, to the business owners and, you know, the, the, the fact that y'all are practicing what you're, what you're preaching is making an impression on me for you to say, I'm going through this because even my role with halftime, there are things that I have to talk through. And if I can't talk through them as the head of halftime, then I'm not, I'm not actually, you know, drinking my own Kool-Aid. Well, I will just comment on that really quick because the coaches at halftime are all folks who've gone through the program and are in similar 
situations. As they will say, we've paid the dump tax. We've already been down that path, right? <laughs> so, I mean, you have the, the 40 coaches at halftime are all executives and business owners and entrepreneurs who have been there, done that. So they know exactly what you're thinking and what you've gone through. I mean, Lloyd Reeb, who does coaching for us, has coached halftimers for 20 years. Uh, and I just want to one comment on the church really quick. The church is fantastic at what they do. Helping a top leader uh, or leaders understand their true calling. The church, unfortunately, just isn't equipped for that. It's nothing against yeah. the church. Just yeah. not right. I mean, the, the church, you know, so what I see a lot is leaders will be working in the kids ministry or parking cars or, you know, looking for the, the church expansion pro or working on the church expansion project. And that's all, that's great. But volunteerism is much different. Volunteerism is something you can do. Your calling is what you have to do. There's a big difference between those two. Mm, that's a good man that that would that could take some unpacking too yeah and that that's a so volunteering is what you can do calling is what you have to that's right. and if you don't if you don't follow that calling then it's a perpetual state of smaller discontent i mean that's rick, really i was just going to say rick warren would say that if you don't follow your calling the world is missing out on your contribution because no one else has the exact calling you have. And which I think is quite powerful. Doesn't mean you won't get to heaven. I mean, that, no, that's you know, not I, it at all. Yeah, no, yeah. Not, that's not it at all. And, and, and if we can bring in Piper to this, it's that you won't enjoy, you won't enjoy the work of your hands as you would otherwise. Yeah. I think that I think the litmus test is at the end of the day. Do you feel yeah. energized or are you ready to lay on the couch and take a nap? And if what you're doing energizes you, then you're you're in your sweet spot, most likely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's whew, so many questions. So many questions. So you know, you, you've been doing that for what a decade, a little over a decade you know, yeah. helping run halftime, you're in that, that chairman role. What else, what else are you doing with your time? Because chairman is not as busy as CEO, right? Yeah. So what, what else, what else are you doing with your, so, uh, with your time? Yeah, I would, two years ago, when I was thinking of transitioning, the, the leaders, or I'd say a year ago, came to me and said, hey, Dean, do you want to go through the halftime fellows program? I'm like, go through the halftime fellows program. I facilitated that thing for 10 years. Why do I want to go through that? <laughs> and then once I got over my own pride and ego, I, I said, absolutely. So I went through our program because there is no better program in the world. And I can say that I, where else would I go to figure out my next season? And everyone's yeah. like, even Bob Buford had 16 different seasons underneath the same kind of general personal mission statement, but he had different things that he started. And so for me, as I went through this pro the halftime program, one thing that became really, really obvious to me was I help, or I love to help individuals and companies get unstuck. I love to have conversations. I love to consult them. And then I love to connect them. So they blessed me with numerous connections over the last 12 years. And so I was talking to an individual as I was going through the program and they said to me, they go, Dean, you're a trusted resource. If I'm stuck in any, you know, situation, I know I can come to you and trust you, but you can also connect me to someone who can help me. So I thought, yeah, you know, she's right. So as I was going through this process uh, and I was working on a talk that I was going to give, the lady asked, well, what are you really passionate about? And I mentioned helping people get unstuck and connecting them. And she said, have you ever met this gentleman named Craig LeMasters? I said, no. She goes, he wrote a book called Unstuck. So she set up Craig and I Zoom call and uh, just a world-class guy, solid Christian man, families, solid Christians. And I went over and visited their company. It's called GXG. 
And, okay. and what they do is actually Craig was in the marketplace as a fortune 400 CEO and used Bain and McKenzie for a number of years, but got a little frustrated because they couldn't help him get unstuck in specific areas. And Craig mm -hmm. said, well, why don't we go and find people? This might sound familiar, might sound like what I just said about halftime. Why don't we go find people who've paid the dumb tax, people who have been there, done that, world-class leaders who can actually help individuals get unstuck and businesses get unstuck. And it was just a perfect fit for my gifting and my calling. So I've joined GXG and we help nonprofits, for-profits, individuals, but we don't do the consulting. I would sit down with, let's say you, Russ, and you'd say, well, here's where we're stuck or here is our A and we want to get to B. And we talk about the areas that would, would be needed to get you there. And then we put together world-class experts who've been there, done that to help you get to B. And I just absolutely love the model. I did that the model yeah. of major companies, nonprofits, it's industry agnostic. It can help with anything. So that's what I do now. That's my next, that's, that's the season I'm in right now working with them. Yeah. And, and well, it's, it's very clear that halftime has made a huge difference in your life and the people speaking into your life and you're still very passionate about it. And, mm -hmm. and that's awesome. So number one, people need to go. And if you haven't read the book, halftime, grab a copy and read it, read it and, and follow up on on the steps that the Lord reveals to you through that book, some of those principles. And then unstuck, you know, I think the, and, and having heard about GX, uh, G and, and talked to Craig and heard some of that story, it's very clear, you know, the, the value proposition they bring. And, and I, I studied and got an MBA while I was teaching and I'm sitting there and I'm like, all right, what am I going to do with the MBA? And I, you know, talking to different people who were in, in those consulting roles and, you know, talking about the Craig's experience with, you know, the, the McKinsey's and the Baines and, you know, those are, those are some great people working in there, but it's, it's a Swiss army knife that doesn't always end up being a Swiss army knife. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the being able to go out and find, all right, I'm going to build a custom Swiss army knife just for your company is the way I heard Craig's story and, and thought through it in my mind. And that's a good feeling knowing that, that, you know, you have that. And so, you know, in, in any person who feels stuck, no matter what they're doing, GXG, you know, whether GXG is an application or not, should get, grab Craig's book as well. And we'll put links in the, in the notes here for po people to go and find and, and go get a copy of those on Amazon. But uh, so, so in the, so in that GXG model, the unstuck, you guys talked about A to B and what, how does that apply in, in, you know, the, the, you said it links back to, to halftime, the dumb tax. How does that apply back to our spiritual life and us walking through and being able to say, so how does that, how does that circle back? And I've got a couple of ideas, but I just want to, I want you to go first. How does that apply to what we're doing and the examples we see in, in, in the Bible of people paying the dumb tax and then you know, it, it not either not applying it or, you know, people going by and saying, no, I'll do it on my own. What, how does that apply? Well, I think you would agree with me. The Bible talks a lot about wisdom mm -hmm. and acquiring wisdom, right? Mm -hmm. uh, spiritual gift is, is, is wisdom, right? And so the idea of halftime and the idea of GXG is, is pretty similar. And that is when someone begins at point A, you want to go and identify wisdom in others who have done that and been there. It's the same way I apply way back in the, in the 80s when I started in the financial services industry. I wanted to be a million dollar producer for Merrill Lynch. Well, I went and hung out with the million dollar producer, right? He's the one who had the wisdom. He's been there, done that, paid the dumb tax. So it's very similar, I think, is the, the Bible say acquire as much wisdom as you possibly can. So who is that? Who is that person? Who is that organization? Who's that company that can get you to be? It's the same idea here at halftime, right? If, if you're sitting here in this smoldering discontent season, trying to figure out what's God's purpose for my life, what is my calling, what are my passions, et cetera, 
who has been there and who has done that already, who has the wisdom because they've gone through it. So you identify those folks. It's the same thing with GXG's model, right? It, it's mm -hmm. I'm stuck. Mm -hmm. I want to get to be who are the folks with wisdom who can get me there. So I think the Bible is very, very clear on acquiring wisdom in, in aligning mm. yourself with people who have wisdom. Yeah, you know, another way to think about it is the value of unstuck in the service that, that GHG provides is, you know, when you're young, they say, hey, go shadow. You want to find out more about that, how to do that, who's done that well, go shadow somebody that you know is in that line of work, like you're talking about with the million dollar producer, go shadow that person. And GHG goes through the due diligence of saying, who are those people you should shadow? And then not only, you know, not, not necessarily shadowing them, but they're bringing them in to help you target a specific question or specific area in your not-for-profit or for-profit business and organization. And so, you know, it, it's a, the, the model is, is awesome. And I know you guys have, you know, tons of examples of, of you know, walking different people through those. In, any of those examples you'd like to share? Well, I would just one one of the things that just came to mind as you're talking. A, a, a recent client at GXG said it's really breakthrough. GXG helps you get to the point of breakthrough. Mm -hmm. So, a nonprofit that we recently worked with, the Tommy Nova Center, that works with the special needs kids, they were mm -hmm. stuck, and a GXG put together an advisory board for them. And as he will say, it was life-changing for the organization and the and the ministry they have doubled the number of people they're serving they have brought in a whole bunch of cash it's just been a, a game changer for them mm. and even for uh, other companies when i arrived at gxg there was a very large insurance company that was struggling with their technology and uh, I sat in on a call there was a world class expert from the silicon graph silicon valley who spoke into their challenge, their stuckness, mm -hmm. if you will, and they had breakthrough. He helped them break through. And it was really fascinating to watch. So there's a process that we use at GXG to do that. But mm -hmm. the individuals, what I've been more impressed with, I love the model, but what I've been most impressed with is the, is the talent that they can assemble. People love to help other people. People love to share their expertise. And so if we have a, a very large company that's trying to get into cryptocurrency, which we do, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we identified three to four people right away who could speak into that, that were, had wisdom expertise because they just love sharing. So there's a numerous, we've worked with numerous companies over the last five years, big, small nonprofits, helping them get unstuck. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And, and, and it see, you know, the, I think the, you know, kind of bringing it back to 20,000 feet, the, the idea of, and, and I went from a shift from being a teacher and, and coach and, you know, driving a school bus and everything else to financial services, right? So you came out of financial service. I was going into financial services and that was a big, you know, big shift, but the smoldering discontent was there. Mm -hmm. Smoldering discontent was there and not to, not to say any of that, you know, being a teacher and, and a coach and, and doing all those different things, some of the greatest lessons in formative years of my life. Sure. And, but going through that, you know, and, and that's the, I think the key is you looking for the connections between, all right, what did I do during those eight, that eight year period where I was, I was working in a school? What did I go through? What did I learn that prepared me for the next thing? Because they link, right? There, there's a there's a there's a building block kind of of mentality or understanding, and the wisdom that you got in the financial services industry prepared you to lead halftime. That's now prepared you in a, in a different way to to work with GXG and to and to help others go in quickly and efficiently bring in all the wisdom uh, that the right wisdom that they can for a specific solution. And that's the, the beauty of walking with the Lord is that it's not just one of those, hey, he didn't leave you in, in the desert or he didn't leave you in wherever he put you for a little while. It, it's not just some random experience. It all flows together. Yeah, and I, well said. 
Yeah, I, when you look back, and even for me, when I look back and start connecting the dots, even from 1987 through 2009, it's very mm -hmm. interesting when you're going through it, you're, you're wondering, why is this happening? This seems like a left, left turn or, you know, to me. But yeah. when you connect the dots looking back, it, 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 it's fascinating. I'll also say this, that the Lord has packaged you up already in a way to use your gifting and talent and abilities. A lot of people think when, hey, I'm, if I really surrender and I go through, let's say, a halftime process, I'm going to be shipped to Africa and, uh, you know, or whatever it may be. Right. And uh, very, very infrequent does that happen. It does happen, but it's not all the time. But the Lord uses you and how all, you, you don't need to bring anything more than what you already have. You just need to uncover what you have. So this idea of if you if you're an accountant and you come in to figure out your calling and purpose, I highly doubt the Lord's going to say, go build homes for Habitat for Humanity. That probably wouldn't be a fit. What you need, you are all that out of yourself to have a better understanding of who you are. So it, it, initially, people, I think, get nervous about this whole idea of I'm going to surrender and figure out what God wants to do with me next. But it, it really more freeing than scary because it's not going to be a huge change in most cases yeah i like that 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 i that, that what you need you already have and and you know getting back to you know it's it's not a it's not a secret to the lord right we're the ones we're the ones doing the discovery mm -hmm. it's not a secret to the lord and and if he wants the best for us that's all we're asking is to discover what's best, right? Yeah, and I would say, Russ, most people don't take time to really do that. It does yeah. take time to understand yourself. You do need to, you know, people feel sometimes that that's selfish. The reality is to be the best version of yourself takes time for you to focus on yourself. Mm. It really have to carve out a season and just say, this is going to be the season that Dean Nawalny is going to figure out who Dean really is in the Lord. What is his gifting for me, right? What are my gifts and passions? It takes time, but a lot of people don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Okay. So that's the action item to take, to take a couple of steps to take the time and uh, in, in reading or listening to, or, or, you know, however you want to interact with the halftime or unstuck material as a first starter, or if you want to fast forward, if you don't even read to read the book, you just want to call Rhonda. You want to call Rhonda and say, Hey, Rhonda, what's right for me. I know this is a good thing. And, and you know, today is the day of action. I think is what I'd, I'd like to leave everybody listening with. And Dean, this is, this has been eye opening for me and encouraging to me. And I'm sure it will be for, for those who listen. And I really appreciate the, the, the honesty. I think that the, the candid responses and the honesty that, you know, just even though you've gone through very successful number of successful careers and different things in life, you still take the time and respond to the challenge of those around you to say, all right, I'm the head of halftime and I'm going to go back through the halftime fellows program. It, that, that is, to me, that's the full circle of practicing what you preach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Russ. This was fantastic. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, we appreciate it. Again, this is the Three Wins Podcast, Legacy Advisory Partners, special guest, Dean Nawalny. We appreciate you being on the podcast with us. Have a, have a great day, everybody, and look forward to having you back on the next podcast coming up shortly.